the elements of the history and physical exam that are relevant to our patients with alopecia. After this introduction, we will do a deep dive into two very high yield conditions for the purposes of board examinations. These conditions include alopecia areata and tinea capitis. I have included schematics of these two conditions at the bottom of our screen, and it is my sincerest hope that by the end of this video, you will be able to not only distinguish these two conditions in terms of their presentations, but that you will also have mastered the pathophysiology, workup, and management of each. There are three major components of the physical exam that are likely to show up on examinations. These components include the scalp examination, the hair pull test, and the tug test. And we will now go through each of these components in detail. During the scalp examination, there are really two key questions that we are trying to answer. The first of these questions is, is there evidence of inflammation? And the second of these questions is, is the distribution of hair loss focal or diffuse? As an example, on the bottom left-hand corner of our screen, we can see that in this patient with alopecia, there's clearly some erythema, as well as some evidence of scale and therefore inflammation. And as we will see moving forward, recognizing the presence or absence of inflammation in our patients with alopecia will allow us to distinguish the different types of alopecia from one another. Also during the scalp examination, we are able to ask the question, is the distribution of hair loss focal or diffuse? We can see here in the center of our screen that this patient with alopecia has a focal distribution of hair loss, whereas the alopecia patient in the bottom right-hand corner of our screen clearly demonstrates a more diffuse rather than focal distribution of hair loss. These distinctions between inflammatory and non-inflammatory alopecia, as well as focal and diffuse patterns of hair loss, will be essential in our discussions moving forward. The second component for the physical exam when it comes to patients with alopecia is the hair pull test. While there is certainly variation in the use of this hair pull test clinically, there is a characteristic way in which this test shows up on examinations. During the hair pull test, the physician will take a bundle of approximately 60 hairs and hold these hairs between her index finger and thumb. Then, starting at the base of this bundle of hairs, she will then gently pull along the length of the hair shaft all the way up to the tip of this bundle of hairs. If during this episode of gentle pulling, the physician is able to extract at least six strands of these hairs out of the original 60 hairs, then we can say that the patient is currently having active shedding of their hair. And therefore, we would say that this patient had a positive hair pull test. This is because the patient had at least 10% of her hairs removed during this hair pull test maneuver. As we will see moving forward for the purposes of examinations, question writers frequently like to use the hair pull test to test your knowledge of which types of alopecia will have active shedding present. And therefore, understanding the hair pull test, at least for the purposes of examinations, can help you greatly in distinguishing the different types of alopecia. For the sake of completeness, we will also discuss a third component of the physical exam for our patients with alopecia, which is the tug test. During the tug test, the physician takes one of the patient's hairs, and then grasping that hair from either end, pulls gently on both sides of the hair simultaneously, stretching it out in either direction. If the hair ultimately breaks, then it is said that the patient has a positive tug test, which can indicate that the patient's individual hairs are weak, brittle, or otherwise lacking in integrity. Overall, then, there are three major components of the physical exam in our patients with alopecia. We have, of course, the scalp examination, where we look for inflammation, as well as the distribution of hair loss. We have the hair pull test, where we look to see if there is evidence of active shedding. And we have the tug test, where we test the integrity of the patient's individual hairs. Now that we've discussed the physical exam for alopecia patients in detail, let's move into our first major condition, which is alopecia areata. In alopecia areata, our classic patient is going to present with well-circumscribed, smooth areas of hair loss. And one extremely important aspect of the scalp examination to note in these patients is that they will have no erythema, scale, or signs of inflammation. And this is very high yield to keep in mind, especially when compared to some of our inflammatory types of alopecias, such as tinea capitis. We can see on the right-hand side of our screen that this patient has a well-circumscribed, smooth area of hair loss, and there is really no appreciable erythema, scale, or inflammation. And this is therefore very typical of alopecia areata. It should be noted that the scalp is by far the most common location for alopecia areata to occur. However, this can also manifest in a patient's beard or really on any other body surface where their hair may grow. In terms of the pathophysiology, it should be noted that alopecia areata is an immune-mediated condition, specifically with an autoimmune etiology. This is in contrast to some of our other types of alopecia that we will discuss, which may be driven by other medical, infectious, or hormonal processes. In our clinical photograph on the previous screen, we had a patient with unifocal alopecia areata, whereas in this schematic image in the center of your screen, we have an example of multifocal alopecia areata. Please note, however, that these lesions are once again well circumscribed, and they also clearly lack any erythema, scale, or evidence of inflammation. And therefore, whether the lesions are unifocal or multifocal, the non-inflammatory nature of these discrete lesions is highly characteristic of alopecia areata. The diagnosis of alopecia areata is largely clinical in nature, however it should be noted that if we were to perform a hair pull test, that about half of patients with alopecia areata, if they are actively shedding at the time, 
will have a positive hair pull test. This is in contrast to some of the other types of alopecia that we will discuss in our second alopecia video, such as trichotillomania, in which patients are not going to have active shedding and will therefore have a negative hair pull test. However, clinically, we rely much more on our physical exam findings, such as seeing unifocal or multifocal, well-circumscribed, non-inflammatory lesions in order to clinch a clinical diagnosis of alopecia areata. However, given the propensity of these patients to have autoimmune thyroid disease, such as Hashimoto's thyroiditis, as well as other types of thyroid disease, we will also sometimes check a TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone, as well as a T4 in order to check these patients for thyroid disease. It should also be noted that in terms of nomenclature, if the entire scalp of the patient is involved, then this patient would be deemed to have alopecia totalis. In contrast, if the entire body of the patient is involved, then the name for this condition more specifically would be alopecia universalis. One other classic feature of alopecia areata that frequently shows up on examinations is the presence of exclamation point hairs. Now, if you think of an exclamation point, the top of the exclamation point is going to be uniform and somewhat thick, and it ultimately culminates in a single point at the bottom of the exclamation point. This is quite similar to what we would call an exclamation point hair here located in the center of this image in a patient with alopecia areata. As you can see, the most distal portion of this particular hair is quite thick, but as we move closer to the surface of the scalp, we can hopefully appreciate that the hair is much more thin. This is because the portion of the hair that is most proximal to the scalp is currently diseased because it is actively undergoing attack via an autoimmune etiology. However, the outermost or most distal portion of the hair is not diseased, and therefore it still remains thick and normal relative to the more proximal portions of the hair which are undergoing autoimmune attack. This results in a hair in alopecia areata that is more thick at the top and more thin at the bottom or more proximally, thus resulting in what is classically referred to as an exclamation point appearance. And this is a principle that question writers frequently like to show on examinations. In managing patients with alopecia areata, corticosteroids are going to be first-line therapy. Patients with more limited disease can get significant benefit from topical clobetazole, which is a high-potency corticosteroid. From this point, we can progress to steroid injections, which you will likely see clinically in the form of intralesional triamcinolone. It should also be noted that for patients who have greater than 50% of their scalp involved, such as this patient in the bottom right-hand corner of our screen, then we can proceed with immunotherapy. This can include agents such as methotrexate or mycophenolate, which can help to suppress the patient's immune system and decrease the immune-mediated destruction that we see in patients with alopecia areata. Moving on to tinea capitis, our classic patient is going to be a prepubertal child, most commonly a male, with patches of hair loss. On physical exam, these patients will present with erythema, scale, or even pustules in some cases. But regardless of the exact features, these patients will have evidence of inflammation, as shown in this example of tinea capitis, where we can clearly see erythema as well as apparent areas of scale in this area of alopecia. It should also be noted that in some cases of tinea capitis, patients can present with a black dot variant, which we will review in the coming slides. Not surprisingly, because these patients have ongoing inflammation, that can also present with pruritus, and because tinea capitis is ultimately a tinea infection, it is not uncommon for patients to present with lymphadenopathy in response to the infectious process that ultimately underlies this condition. As we hinted at on the previous slide, the underlying pathophysiology in tinea capitis is a fungal infection. More specifically, tinea capitis is caused by a dermatophyte infection. The most common causes of tinea capitis include microsporum, epidermophyton, and trichophyton, and we can remember these three dermatophytes by the mnemonic MET, or M-E-T. It should be noted here that out of these three dermatophytes, the most common cause of tinea capitis is actually the T, or trichophyton, and this is a little factoid that really likes to show up on examinations. It should also be noted that patients are at an increased risk for tinea capitis if they have diabetes or immunosuppression, and this should not be surprising for us because as we have explored in other videos, patients who have diabetes or immunosuppression are at an increased risk of developing fungal infections in general. As I mentioned previously, there is a black dot variant of tinea capitis that is important to be aware of for examinations. These patients will present with this characteristic appearance of pinpoint follicular black lesions in the area of hair loss. This is because if there is sufficient destruction from the infection to take, for example, this hair that I've drawn here on the right-hand side of the screen, and the follicle of this hair is essentially cut off at this point, all we will be able to see from above looking down at this is simply a black dot. And this is what ultimately creates this classic black dot variant appearance that we can see in some patients with tinea capitis. One extremely high yield presentation of tinea capitis that very, very frequently shows up on examinations is the carry-on. In the carry-on variant of tinea capitis, the patient will present with a large, erythematous, inflammatory, boggy mass that classically presents in the vertex scalp, as seen in this patient. And we have created this schematic here for you to really cement this image in your mind of this erythematous, boggy mass on the vertex scalp. In order to emphasize this carry-on presentation of tinea capitis, we also have here a clinical photograph, and as you can clearly see in the center of your screen, there is this large, erythematous, inflammatory mass in the vertex scalp, and this is highly characteristic of tinea capitis.
The diagnosis of tinea capitis is typically going to be clinical. However, as we'll see in a moment, the management of this condition commonly involves the use of oral medications that carry significant side effects, most notably hepatotoxicity. Therefore, it can be helpful to establish a diagnosis. The first step in doing so is to perform a KOH prep, and ultimately what we are looking for in a KOH prep is the presence of hyphae under the microscope, and these can be appreciated in the image on the right-hand side of our screen, both here as well as here, where we can see these budding hyphae, indicating that we indeed have the presence of a dermatophyte infection. And from that point, although KOH prep would be our first test, our best test in the case of diagnosing a tinea infection is typically going to be a fungal culture, so we can send that off as well. As a fungal culture has a higher specificity and can help us make the determination that we indeed need to use oral medications to treat this condition. It is worth emphasizing that unlike some of our other tinea infections that we discussed in a separate video, the treatment of tinea capitis necessitates the use of an oral antifungal. The reasoning behind this can best be appreciated by looking at the hair follicle in our skin layers image on the right hand side of our screen. Tinea capitis is of course an infection of the hair follicle, and therefore we need our medication to penetrate the hair follicle in order to adequately treat the infection. As you can appreciate here on the right hand side of your screen, there is clearly a vascular supply to the hair follicle itself, and these blood vessels travel up the length of the hair follicle, allowing us to penetrate more deeply if we are able to reach a sufficient blood level of the given medication. This is in contrast to a topical approach, which is really not going to be able to permeate into the hair follicle from its more superficial starting point. We need something that can get into the bloodstream and penetrate up into the hair follicle, and this is exactly what these oral antifungals accomplish. Our options for oral antifungals include griseofulvin, terbinafine, and azoles. The most commonly tested side effect is most likely the hepatotoxicity that is associated with the use of terbinafine, and therefore it is essential that we have both baseline and follow-up measures of the patient's LFT to monitor for this critical side effect. In conclusion, we have provided an introduction to alopecia, highlighting some of the key principles of the physical exam, especially the hair pull test. We also went through a detailed discussion of alopecia areata, as well as the carry-on and black dot variants of tinea capitis. And in this slide, I've provided one last high-yield summary of the key similarities and differences between alopecia areata and tinea capitis. And ultimately, the key principle that drives all the differences between these two conditions is the underlying pathophysiology. If we simply understand that alopecia areata is an autoimmune condition, whereas tinea capitis is an infectious process, it should then make sense to us that tinea capitis involves inflammation, and in some cases lymphadenopathy, whereas alopecia areata does not. This also helps us to make sense of the management of each of these two conditions. An oral antifungal for our infectious process 